This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruski. We're talking with Siobhan Scott on this segment. Specifically, wanting to get her insight into the... And I can't even say if it's the most recent by the time this airs because there's a whole like 24 hours in between and there could be another mass shooting between now and then, which is just the reality of it. There probably will be. Uh, but I want to get her insight into the one that specifically happened in Allen, Texas uh, at the outlet mall. Siobhan has written the book, The Minds of Mass Killers, Understanding and Interrupting the Pathway to Violence. Uh, Siobhan, what do we know about this one uh, and the murderer in this case? So far, we know that um, this person was a 33-year-old Hispanic male. His parents apparently did not speak English because law enforcement was using translation to speak to them. And he identified as a white supremacist or a neo-Nazi, which is a little bit unusual. You do see it happen. But he had left a trail of paranoid, anti-immigrant, racist um beliefs all over the internet. And this, of course, is being analyzed now to try to make sense out of this. But a 33-year-old wearing body armor, going to a public place with an AR-15, trying to kill as many people randomly as he possibly can. This, again, fits the style of the mass shooter that we've come to see on almost a weekly basis somebody who's just lashing out at the world, trying to hurt as many people as he can. And this is usually a person who is blaming other people for his personal problems and becomes paranoid. And in the white supremacist world, it's always the immigrants that are taking our jobs, that are the cause of all the social problems in our country. It was also suggested that this person is an incel or identified it as an incel, and I don't have any details on that yet. But that, again, would fit the MO, a person who's focused on anger, retribution, and lashing out. And whether they're blaming women or they're blaming Mexicans or or people of another religion, whatever it is, it's that thread of paranoia, again, that I think makes people so incredibly dangerous, particularly when they have easily accessible weapons of war and can just have this incredible stock of ammo, body armor. And it's miraculous that more people weren't hurt, actually, in this crowd. Obviously, someone like this is not mentally well. It it, it always strikes me as, okay, this is the group that you feel slighted by or you hate or whatever it may be. But then to go out and just randomly shoot people at a mall, it's like the two don't seem to correlate very well. If you're going to have your hate, then why are you taking it out on people who have nothing to do with what you have this this fixation on? Yeah, it would be interesting to know if this person had ever worked there. He was a security guard and apparently had a weapons permit and clearance to work as a security guard with weapons. And so that was one of my questions. Is it possible that he had a grudge or a grievance with, you know, this particular retail establishment? Or were there other factors? Often there are reasons that people choose, um, you know, the, the location, but the reasons are symbolic. So, um, you know, some of the stores up in Buffalo, the shooter went to a market that was largely used by black people. Um, Other times it's been an ethnic deli somewhere, you know, where people have gone in. And so they, they choose the targets for reasons that are symbolic to them. But the people that happen to be there, it's it's just very bad luck. There's no intention to target specific individuals in that way. We always hear after the fact, and now we're looking at his social profile, and he's been posting this, and he's been posting that. Uh, Can we do anything about any of this stuff until before it happens, or do we just, is it just in our country the way we have things worked out where you can say pretty much anything you want, uh, brag about this or that, come short, I guess, of making a direct threat on a mall or other people, but do everything but that. Uh, and nothing really can be done. It's just, look, this person's a loose cannon, and at any moment they may go and do something, but we can never step in. 
Yeah, this is sure one of the things I believe very strongly is that we need to empower the FBI to be tracking these folks and to be monitoring. So often, as in the case of the Parkland killer, people have made very direct statements. I'm going to be the next school shooter. I'm going to be the next mall shooter. I'm going to, you know, have the highest kill score. These things are said online all the time. Mm-hmm. And there are cases where there have been interventions made where guns have been taken away from people, where there have been prosecutions and arrests of people who have made very specific threats because someone has called the FBI's attention to them. And I think we really need to be looking at this because most of the time people who do this, they do leak for months and sometimes even years, whether they tell friends, they tell relatives, or it's just random stuff that they're posting online. Other people are aware and they'll say later, oh, well, he was always the guy that said those things. Mm -hmm. You know, so I I think when we're looking at this kind of cultural phenomena where this has just become the way, the quick way to be famous and to become important, um, we need to be looking at how can we still of course, have a society based upon free speech, but at the same time, take these kinds of threatening behaviors seriously. It it really makes all the difference in the kind of society that we can live in, whether any of us can feel safe to go anywhere. This is the buzz I was seeing on social media yesterday was people saying, I don't feel safe to go to the mall. I don't feel safe to go to the church. I don't feel safe to go to an outdoor music festival in the summer. And I think we can all nod our heads and say, yeah, you have to pause think about it at this point you do and it, it's sad i mean but these things you know they run through my mind at any of those things that you just mentioned if you're at a concert if you're at the mall the, these things that sh- shouldn't be running through your mind but are and they they actually need to be almost so you can be somewhat of a, aware of how to handle a situation should you need to try and get out of it or get away from a, a place but this has just become just such the norm for us to to live in this sort of way and everyone wants the answer what do we do to stop this uh, you know yeah it, yeah it really has become the norm and i i think the um tendency now is for people to throw their hands up and to just live in fear and say there's nothing we can do when i think you know as i said even even if the first thing we do is say if i see something i am going to notify one call FBI, you know, I am going to make a report when I notice something. And if more people did that, we would be able to stop more of these incidents. We may not be able to stop all of them, but we would be able to stop more. And of course, we can do more as far as red flag laws. You've got all kinds of, you know, safe gun storage legislation pending in different ways. So even if, you know, the Second Amendment debate is going to continue, obviously, And we've got lots of different points of view on that. But there are still things we can do about, you know, high capacity magazines, gun storage laws, red flag laws to get these weapons of war out of the hands of dangerous people. And I I don't think we need to just throw our hands up and say there's nothing that can be done. At the very least, we need to put some, you know, speed bumps in. I know we can't really probably ever eliminate any of these sort of things, but but speed bumps work. They make you from going they make you slow down and if we can put a lot more of those things in 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 place yeah yeah yeah, are we ever going to stop all this no but if we can put some speed bumps in place that maybe after somebody who's going to be going down a road like this maybe they get sick of the bumps and going this is just not worth it the amount of hoops i have to jump through to get this it's not easy yeah Yeah. it's not easy and and at this point it's just far too easy when any Uh, person regardless of their mental health history can walk into a gun store buy a weapon of war high capacity magazines and just drive over to the mall you know we've got to slow this down and i do know that we stop lots of these people right now we have no way of knowing how many. But every time a a kid makes a threat and they are referred to a therapist who makes a good connection with them and they take a different path and they don't go down the path to violence, it's it's worth it, you know, because you're saving, what, 10 lives, 20 lives every time there's an interruption. Yeah. And hopefully saving the life of that person that that for whatever reason went down that path is being able to be pulled out of that before they make a horrible decision that destroys the lives of others and their own. 
Exactly. So whenever I hear people saying there's nothing we can do, they're, they're going to get an argument from me. <laughs> you know, there's nothing easy that we can just do that's going to make this all stop. But there is lots we can do. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. The Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. Siobhan Scott, psychotherapist and author, author of the book, The Minds of Mass Killers, Understanding and Interrupting the Pathway. To violence. A big thank you as always for joining us and giving us your insights. Couldn't do it without you. My name is Tony Bruski. If you like the podcast, press subscribe wherever you're downloading so you don't miss any breaking updates or discussions on the cases we're following for you right here. I'm Tony Bruski. Stay with us. Stay with us.